Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the regular board meeting of the Western Municipal Water District Board. Um, Tammy, would you please read the protocols and call the roll? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Pursuant to Western Municipal Water District Resolution 3266, in an effort to protect the public health, prevent the spread of COVID-19, and because state and local officials are recommending measures to promote social distancing, the public may view this board meeting virtually, via Zoom, and in person. This meeting is being live streamed at WMWD.com and will be video recorded for on-demand viewing and broadcasting purposes. As stated on the agenda, members of the public who wish to comment on any item on the agenda may make comments in person, virtually via Zoom, or by submitting comments on the district's website. Comments received on the district's website before 4.30 p.m. January 17th, 2023 will be made part of the board meeting record. For those participating in the Zoom meeting who wish to provide public comment, you please indicate such by using the raise hand feature and we will call on you individually. For those participating by telephone who wish to provide public comment, you may do so by pressing star six to unmute yourself and star nine to activate the raise hand feature. If there is more than one caller, you will be identified and called on one at a time. Any public comment will be limited to three minutes in duration. However, the presiding officer reserves the right to reduce the amount of time you'll be allowed to speak to ensure that all members of the public have an opportunity to provide their comment. I will now take roll call for the meeting. Due to the complexity of conducting this meeting by Zoom and telephonically, I will not be taking roll call for staff members or the public at this time. Director Torres. Here. Director Denstead. Good morning, I'm present. Good morning, Director Roten. Here. <clears throat> Director Rizvi. Good morning, I'm on Zoom. Thank I you. should be there in five minutes. Thank you, good morning. President Gardner. I am present. Thank you. President Gardner, you do have a quorum today. Great, thank you very much. Um, at this time, we will uh, go to the Pledge of Allegiance, and we are joined by Sharon um, Druin from uh, the Operations Department. Good morning. Everyone, please rise. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharon Druin. I'm the Executive Assistant at the Operations Department. I have been privileged to have had 22 years here at Western. It's a great organization, and I do appreciate all your support. If you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Sharon. Have a great day. Thank you, Sharon. You answered all my questions. <laughs> Okay, brings us to public comments. Tammy, do we have anyone in the room or on Zoom who would like to comment on things that are not specifically on the agenda? At this time, I have no public comments for uh, general comments. Okay. Um, it, we will have individual public comment on each agenda item as it comes up. So if you are here to speak on one of those or online to speak on one of those, you will have an opportunity when it comes up. Brings us to presentations, and I'm going to switch them. Um, it will take the um, scholarship first and then go to the presentation by Mr. Adcock. Michelle? Thank you, President Gardner, members of the board. I have the pleasure of being here today to share with you some information about our 2022-2023 uh, Western Endowed Scholarship Program, where we get to recognize this year's recipients at the post-secondary schools within our local service area. Western's Endowed Scholarship Program is a funding partnership between Western and three of these local post-secondary post public schools, two universities, and one community college. At Western, water use, education, and efficiency are a top priority. Our education program can currently be broken down into three focus areas, our K through 12 education, our career education and pathways, and community education. Western recognizes the importance of investing in students as future water users, community leaders, and leaders across the industry. To support this, Western currently funds scholarships at Cal State San Bernardino through the Lois B. Krieger Endowed Scholarship, the University of California Riverside through the Charles D. Field Endowed Scholarship, 
and the Riverside Community College Districts, Riverside City College, and Norco College. And joining us today to support her students at the Riverside Community College District Foundation's Development Officer, Marie Termidor. So to qualify for these scholarships, students must have at least a 3.0 grade point average. They also have to express an interest or declare a major in water management, water policy, conservation, environmental studies, or public administration. With us today, in person and virtually, are the recipients of this year's scholarships from Cal State San Bernardino and Riverside Community College District. Unfortunately, this year, we didn't have a recipient from UCR, but we're working with the college and we'll be working with this board to review the guidelines to make sure that we can encourage participation in that program. Our first award recipient is here with us today in person, and her name is Alyssa Brianna Zamora. Who would like to join me? Alyssa is a student at Cal State San Bernardino, and she's currently pursuing a degree in environmental geology. She's looking forward to obtaining her bachelor's degree and securing employment in the geology field. Her goal is to gain the required knowledge to give back to the planet. At this point, I'm going to present the certificate to Brianna for her scholarship, and I'm going to ask the board to come down, congratulate her, and take a video, uh, take a picture. You're welcome. Do you guys want to come on down? All right, uh, next slide please. Our next recipient is from the Riverside Community College District, uh, Norco College. Um, his name is Anand Gafak Alabawe. He is currently a student at the Riverside Community College District's Norco College and he's pursuing a degree in engineering. He is joining us virtually. He's looking forward to using his degree to secure a job as a machine learning specialist specializing in health technology to assist underdeveloped countries and communities. So congratulations. I'm so sorry we weren't able to celebrate you in person, but we hope to um, get you your certificate. Marie has it and she'll be mailing it off to you. Next slide, please. Oh, is he on? He is on. There he is. I can't see him on my... Yep. Good morning and... Oh, good morning. Thanks for the scholarship. I'm very grateful. Um, scholarship was able to help pay for uh, part of my tuition at USC, and I'm very grateful for the community and for the job the community is doing for community as well. And thank you guys. And I'm forever grateful. Great. Thank you so much, and congratulations. Thank you. All right, our next recipient, also joining us virtually, is Erica Stocker from Riverside Community College District's Riverside City College. Is she able to be camera on? Uh, there she is. Yes, I am. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, Erica. Good morning. Um, her goal is to, oh, she's currently pursuing her degree in math and science. Uh, her career goal is to use her education to assist underdeveloped countries that face environmental and geological challenges. 
Congratulations, Erica. Marie has your certificate and she'll be mailing it out to you. Did you wanna say a few things? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you so much, Western. This has helped a lot in my journey and I am now actually on my way to class at Cal Poly Humboldt. So thank you, Western, <laughs> for uh, helping me in this journey and I will remember Western along with this. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you and congratulations. And I, Next slide, please. And with that, congratulations to this year's scholarship recipients. I do have to say that we as Western are lucky to have the opportunity to support these aspiring youth. I think you're seeing it. Somebody went off to USC, somebody went off to Humboldt. I think it's easy to say that these scholarships make a difference in people's lives. I know we have a director who was a recipient of the scholarship. And I think when we're able to break down barriers and provide these financial opportunities for students, we get to see amazing things like this happen. So thank you for this opportunity. Congratulations to our recipients. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I don't, I don't have any questions, but I do want to congratulate the recipients. And I do. I also want to uh, uh, say congratulations to Erica. I also got my degree at, from RCC in math and science and um, then transferred to Cal State San Bernardino. So it's really awesome to see, to see that. So I'm alumni from RCC, Cal State San Bernardino, and soon uh, Cal, Cal Baptist University. Um, but no, this award really means a lot. And, um, you know, I got it in 2013. Oh my God, I don't remember. In 2013, um, you know, the, and at the time it was just me. Um, I'm not sure how many awards could have been given out, but to see that the the industry is expanding, people are taking more um, interest in water and environmental studies is, is um, I mean, it, it is really awesome to see, especially um, with the conditions that we have on our in our planet. But I do want to um, encourage you to please reach out to us. Um, I'm not sure where you live, but Director Mike Gardner and I are the re representatives here in Riverside. So if you if you ever need anything, we are a resource. We are here um, to, for mentorship, letters of recommendation, whatever you need, um, because we we want to see this, your careers expand. In, in water, um, that is one of my primary interests. So you can find me on, on social media, Gracie Torres. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. But otherwise, uh, congratulations to all, all the recipients. I did have one question. Yes. Um, Thank you very much. We had a, um, I mean, it was a while back, but there, there had been talks about including um, Cal Baptist University. I, know, I don't remember how that ended up turning out. Uh, not well. Okay. We we didn't take action on that. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that was my only question. I I see two of my alma maters I wanted to ask about the third. So thank you. Congratulations again, everyone. Other questions or comments from board members? Okay. If not, again, I um, would like to offer congratulations to all of the recipients and encourage you to keep going as far and as fast as you can and Western and other water agencies are always looking for good people, so keep us in mind. And thanks very much. <laughs> good commercial for Western. Yeah. We want smart people to come <laughs> back and help us, please. Yes, we do. <laughs> keep us in mind, that's great. Okay, um, we now have um, Nick Adcock, the president and CEO of the Greater Riverside Chambers of Commerce, who is going to give us a presentation. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Um, so Nick, Nick's been with the chamber for about 13 years. Just in September was named president and CEO after Cindy Roth retired. We've worked closely with Nick ever since I've been here nine, almost 10 years ago now. And he has been a, a huge supporter of Western and obviously for the entire business community. So we're really happy to have Nick here. And I've asked him to talk a little bit about some of the chamber's activities. Uh, we were very well aligned with the chamber on uh, lots of issues. They're a big supporter of Solve the Water Crisis. And so, Nick, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you, General Manager Miller. Thank you, Board President Gardner. And good morning to all the members of the board and, of course, staff and members of the public that are here in the room and, of course, uh, virtually joining us here this morning. Uh, again, my name is Nicholas Adcock. I was recently selected to serve as the President and CEO of the Greater Riverside Chambers of Commerce. 
uh, and wanted to spend just a few minutes this morning talking about a couple of things that the chamber uh, continues to work on and, and obviously highlight how we believe that we can continue to work with Western Municipal Water District and its team uh, to serve our region uh, and really truly grow it for uh, all of our Riverside County residents. So I wanna just spend a few minutes, uh, try not to take up too much of your time because I know you're doing a lot of important business. But just to tell you a little bit about myself really quickly, as, as, uh, as Mr. Miller mentioned, um, I've been with the Greater Riverside Chambers of Commerce for 13 years now. I have had the privilege and honor of uh, learning from and being mentored by a number of important inv uh, individuals in my life personally. Of course, chief among them is Cindy Roth. Uh, and when she stepped down as president and CEO of the Riverside Chamber, uh, her first words to me were, good luck, I know you can do it. And, dive in with both feet, and I've tried uh, truly to, to do that. Um, I can tell you, and, and obviously because of the connect connection here at Western, one of the other biggest mentors in my life um, was a friend to all of you here, um, and that is Bob Stockton. And uh, he truly influenced me in terms of what it meant to be a leader, what it meant to be a human, and what it meant to care for a community uh, beyond just your own personal interests. And so really, truly, he is, his lessons um, have stayed with me to this day and will probably impact me for the rest of my life. So it's really actually uh, personally important to me to be able to speak to you all here today because of obviously the role that he had with this organization. But um, this is, presentation is not about me. This presentation is about our chamber and how we can work together with Western to benefit our region. First off, let me tell you a little bit about the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, with a little over 1,100 members, we are the largest Chamber of Commerce in inland Southern California, among the top largest ones in the state. And of those 1,100 members, we represent about 110,000 jobs across the inland Southern California region. So when we talk about issues, we're not just talking about issues that could impact the few, we're talking about issues that could impact the many. Issues that could change our direction of our economy in huge and wonderful ways if we have the time and attention and focus and dedication and energy to make it happen. And so when we talk about issues of advocacy, which has been one of our key components, we're talking about big issues, we're talking about big projects, we're not talking about small things, we're talking about issues that could really shape people's lives, reshape our economy, help small business owners, help employers, help employees, and improve the quality of life for Riverside County residents. And so. We do any number of programs at the Chamber of Commerce that work towards helping many of those issues. And several of you have been involved in various levels in some of those different programs. We have any number of, of councils and committees that focus on issues like uh, advocacy, that focus on issues like job growth and economic development, that focus on workforce development and helping our students succeed so that they can be the future leaders in the community. Uh, helping to think about how we can shape quality of life in Riverside and beyond to really be a dynamic place where people want to live, work, and play. Um, where we can really have positive conversations about how we can advance our region forward so that it is what, so that everybody else recognizes what we know to be true, which is where all the growth in Riverside, or excuse me, all the growth in California is happening here in our region. And we need to really truly capitalize on that. So our Chamber of Commerce does any number of different programs, um, things from uh, helping to uh, bring state leaders down to our region and educating them on the priorities of Riverside County residents to advocating in Sacramento and in Washington DC on the certain priorities that we know they need to be considering in their deliberations to talking with our educational partners and making sure that they are, are working together with industry to prepare our students today to be our business leaders for tomorrow to develop our leaders that are in positions of, of influence now to be the best advocates that they can be through our Leadership Riverside program and others. To uh, working on certain community programs like our Riverside College and Career Fair or the Festival Lights or the upcoming Riverside Job Fair to really truly connect those that are finding their place uh, in their professional career path and getting them towards that next level. Or helping to promote the city of Riverside and the region as a great place for families to again come and enjoy everything that we know to be true and, and real in the city of Riverside. So at the Chamber of Commerce, we do everything from, from working to advocacy to championing the community and really telling a story about Riverside as a dynamic place that we all know it to be, and to really try, try to be a convener of those that are making these decisions, bringing people together 
and trying to solve the big challenges of the day. So from a, from a business perspective, we're not just in the business of helping to make more money, although that's part of it, that's part of a, a thriving economy. It's all about helping to create jobs, to help those that are working in those jobs advance up the economic ladder, and really truly helping to make sure that we are uh, advancing our economy in a positive direction that's going to benefit the entire region. So, so those are some of the 30,000 foot view um, ideas of the chamber and why we strive to be a real positive influence in this community. Now obviously I'm here before you all to talk about how we think uh, water is really going to be critical to that future. And I can tell you as, 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 as Mr. Miller mentioned, um, when the idea of the solve the water crisis came to our uh, Legislative Policy Council and to our Board of Directors, they pretty quickly said, how can we be supportive and how can we get involved? Because they understood that water, amongst so many things, transportation, housing, and so many other things, are critical to our economy. And so when you all, through the board's work, through the work of your team here, really start to, um, as you have been, getting active in terms of advocacy, you can count on this Chamber of Commerce as being a key partner in that taking the message to whoever it needs to be, whether it be in Sacramento or at, at the county board of directors, um, excuse me, board of supervisors, or to Washington, D.C., to make sure that they understand that industry is working with this utility and other utilities across the state to advance our water priorities. Um, I've had a couple of different conversations with several of you to say that um, at least one of my priorities since, since being selected for this role is, you know, we work to raise the level of economic development in our community. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that we have the foundational things that are going to help our economy grow. So, you know, several of you are obviously familiar and, and perhaps were even involved with our work on trying to bring the um, California Air Resources Board, Southern California headquarters to Riverside, and we were very successful in that effort. And that took truly a collaborative effort of public and private sector partners in order to make that happen. But What's critical in that is, is that that was a really high profile, flashy thing that we were able to bring. But as I've shared with a couple of folks is, is that if we don't have the foundational things, if we don't have the basic infrastructure like water, like housing, like transportation, like other of those essential things, then things like CARB don't happen. Then things like the growth of the UCR School of Medicine don't happen. That things like uh, attracting new businesses to our region don't happen. And so what you're going to find, and I want to continue this, is this partnership where we're working on those foundational things to bring that infrastructure to our region to make it a success. So that's, so that's one important element. The second important element is, is that I know, you know we have worked with you all to try and make sure that um, the service of water and the delivery of water to our region has been one, has been ongoing, has been clean and to its best ability and has been affordable to your customers, our members in the region. And I think even in that respect, we've had some great successes. Everything from the water wheeling agreements that I know you worked out with Riverside Public Utilities, we were very supportive of that effort, to some of the other things about establishing new infrastructure up uh, off Van Buren to support those retail customers up there, to other projects like uh, how we can uh, um, uh, build the state delta system so that it's servicing more customers down here. And even in those areas where we've been approaching it from perhaps different perspectives, you approaching it from the water delivery side, uh, our Chamber of Commerce approaching it from the customer side, we've been focused on how we can develop a win-win scenario. One that serves what you need to accomplish, but also serves the needs of my members, your customers, and in, in, in ensuring that we have sustainable and clean water delivery to this region. So I just wanted to share with you all, um, and I don't want to take up too much of your, more of your time, but to essentially say that where you're going to find with the Chamber of Commerce, where you're going to continue to find with the Chamber of Commerce is, is that when we're working together, we are going to be your biggest champion, we're going to be your strongest partner. Okay? When we are approaching things from different perspectives, I can assure you that we're going to be, again, your strongest partner, they're looking for the win-win scenario for both Western and for the Chamber of Commerce and for our region. So I just wanted to share some of those initial comments with you. I look forward as we move forward with the Solve the Water Crisis Coalition about how we really now advocate for those things that are going to shape our region. And I assure you that, that we will be accessible to you and your team 
and making sure that we're doing that. So again, I thank you for all your time this evening. I make myself accessible, or this evening, excuse me, I'm already thinking about where <laughs> I am tonight. Uh, <clears throat> I thank you all for your time this morning uh, and, uh, and just look forward to the continued partnership that I know we'll all have. So, of course, I make myself accessible to all of you, but thank you for your time this morning. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. Are there questions or comments from board members? Comment. Uh, good morning. Good morning. You know, we have absolutely reaped the rewards of our partnership and collaboration with you. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to highlight is the fact that you hold a leadership academy. And we've had a number of our staff members in attendance at that academy, and it, I think it's been a huge benefit, right? Attendees, then graduates, um, current attendee, graduates. Okay, best class ever. Okay. Let, let we mark the time. I've been here all of 20 minutes, and somebody stated that. So. Right, there it is. So, so you know, we really appreciate our partnerships with you and, and the things that you do for the community too that we serve. You know, the military affairs committee that you have as well that you partner with that we are certainly aligned with and trying to help anybody at the base and what that brings for the economic value to the region to keep that base open and, and functional at its highest value, right? So for sure. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming and talking with us about this and all the things that we've partnered with over the years. I've certainly appreciated um, our relationship over the years, and I know that Bob Stockton really had a true love in his heart for you, um, and he was certainly a huge advocate for the chamber, and he was the chairman, and so um, near and dear to my heart as well. Thank you. Thank you, Director Denstead. And, and, and you know, obviously, he, he shaped so much of, of me, but he also influenced our chamber tremendously. And so his impact is felt. Um, to that point, um, uh, I thank you for bringing up uh, the work that we've done together on securing more infrastructure for March Air Reserve Base. And I really want to credit you all for, for prioritizing that. That's a huge priority for our region. That one base alone contributes over a uh, half a billion dollars to our local economy. And so ensuring that it has the infrastructure it needs for its future uh, is going to be really critical. And so I really thank you for prioritizing all of that in your work. Other questions or comments? Okay, um, Nick, I, I wanna thank you for the, the presentation and over my various careers, I've worked a lot with chambers and I, I can say that the Greater Riverside Chamber is the, the most effective and the best organized of any of them. I've worked with some pretty good sized ones. Um, and I, I really appreciate that. You do tremendous work for our region. You mentioned helping bring the California Air Resources Board um, labs here, and that was important. But the chamber also helped bring the UC Medical School, UCR Medical School, um, the UC Accounting Office across the street, Yep. Um, and a variety of other things that are, have brought really good jobs um, and a level of prestige to our region and our city. Um, so I, I want to thank you for that. Uh, it's You talked a little bit about the, the Leadership Academy. The best class was actually 2005 <laughs> and included me. Um, That's when I graduated high school, so I agree. <laughs> Um, it, it really is a, a great program. Um, I had been in Riverside a long time when I took it and I knew some of what they were talking about, but I learned a great deal. It's, it's really a wonderful program. And I'm glad to see that Western puts at least one person in pretty much every class. I think we'll continue to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you, your staff. Um, and we appreciate the presentation this morning. Oh, well, thank you all, and uh, again, look forward to the continued partnership. You all have a wonderful day. Thanks, Dave. Okay, it's time now for the consent calendar. Um, do we have any board member who would like to pull any item from the consent calendar? Seeing none, do we have public comment on consent calendar? We do not, President Gardner. However, I would like to note that uh, item 6A, approval of the minutes of the January 4th regular board meeting and the facilities district. There were two non-substantive changes that were made to those minutes. 
Uh, one was changing the title for Director Torres, and the other was a date in the uh, common language in the agenda, in the minutes. So those were changed and provided to the board and also republished to the website. Uh, so with those changes, I would recommend approval. Okay. Um, so moved. I would look for a motion. Oops, I'm sorry. I made the motion. Okay, so moved. we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Tammy, would you please call the roll? Yes, thank you. Director Torres? Aye. Director Denstead? Aye. Director Roten? Yes. Director Rizvi? Yes. President Gardner? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries five to zero. Great, thank you. Mr. Miller, do we have anything to add to the agenda? Nothing to add today. Okay, thank you. Brings us to our action items. Uh, the first one is approval of a first amendment to an existing contract or construction agreement between Western Meridian Park LLC and Irvine Pipeline Inc. I think that's another one where we have an update in our documentation from the original package. We now have a signed agreement that is before us. That, that's correct. So uh, we brought this to the engineering committee um, knowing that we were still working on getting signatures on the, the agreements, which we have now. Uh, nothing, nothing changed in the agreements. Uh, Derek is uh, virtually here. And uh, Derek, could you please uh, run through the item for the board? Great, thank you. Um, good morning, um, directors. Um, I apologize for not being there in person. I typically do like to uh, present to the board in person. However, um, I have been ill as of late and I'm out of the board um, room to protect everyone else. So feel better. Um, thank you. Um, so this item is related to the Eastern Western interconnection to be built at the Southwest corner of um, Southwest intersection of Cactus and Riverside, um, um, Riverside Drive that's in the northeast corner of the MARB area, the March Air Reserve Base area. The interconnection will allow Western to supply water to new developments within this area and to provide water to the base in the event of an outage of the primary connection under the I-215 freeway at Opportunity Way. Western entered into a construction agreement with Meridian Park LLC and Irvine Pipeline to construct this interconnection on March 8th, 2021. The interconnection facility was to be constructed as an asset to Western, as a contributed asset to Western, as a condition of service for various developments within MARB. To gain access to water in Eastern system, Western will have to purchase capacity in Eastern's tanks, pumps, and transmission pipelines. The cost to purchase the full capacity of the interconnection is about 9.5 million. This is paid by capacity freeze from new development. In September of 2021, Western was awarded a federal grant from the Lo Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation for $4.3 million. As a result of this grant award, the project was required to demonstrate compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act, that's known as NEPA. Western issued a notice to stop work on October 12, 2021. So we we had them we issued the the start um, around. March 2021, and then we told them to stop again. Now, this project was um, certified as NEPA compliant a year later in October of 2022. Western then issued a notice to resume work at that time. Meridian Park and Irvine Pipeline computed delay cost of $308,871.81. This consists of a cost increase due to inflation, cost to store the purchased materials, renewal of bonds, and remobilization cost. Staff have reviewed these costs and are proposing an amendment to the original construction agreement to address these delay costs. Also, the remaining costs for inspection and plan check, requirements for adhering to the cultural resources monitoring plan that arose as part of the NEPA process, and grant requirements for materials purchases, um, as well as the revised required completion date. The, re the request 
from this board is to approve the first amendment to that existing construction agreement between Western Municipal Water District, Meridian Park LLC, and Irvine Pipeline to construct the Eastern Western Marbury interconnection and to authorize payment of $308,841.81 to complete the project. Now present in the meeting in person is Timothy Rees um, of Lewis Incorporated, um, who is operating as an LLC as Meridian Park, who's one of our current parties. And uh, both of us are available to answer any questions. Thank you, Derek. Um, yeah, we're, we're happy to answer okay. any questions. Timothy, you're, you just want to answer questions if they come up, correct? Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Um, I see we do have a speaker card. It is actually from Mr. Reeves. Okay. Um, it's a question answering card. <laughs> do, do we have any questions from board members? Go ahead, Brenda. Thank you, Mr. President. I just had one quick question in relationship to the completion date for the October 2023 um, as a requirement for the funding on this. I want to make sure that we're going to meet hopefully much before the required date. Uh, good morning. My name is Timothy Reeves. As Derek indicated, I work for the Lewis Group of Companies. We're one half of the Meridian Park LLC. Um, we are confident we'll be done around June. Uh, we actually have a pre-con meeting already set up for next on the 24th in anticipation of the amendment getting approved. We don't have much left to order. Everything is either being stored or we're down to some block and maybe some fencing. And I think there was some drainage pipe that Western wanted us to replace, but it's available in Temecula. So we feel confident it shouldn't take more about four to five months, depending on weather and such. But Rain delay. And we're happy, to, we're, we're happy to say that right now. So <laughs> we're, we're okay with a little bit. So, um. But the weather pattern changed as of today is my understanding. So we're looking yeah. good. So. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. That's that was my uh, clarifying point. Thank you, Mr. President. That was all the questions that I had today. Thank you. Great. Any other, other questions? questions? Yeah, other questions. Director Torres. So yeah, right now in the construction phase, uh, about what percentage are you in completion? Uh, about 30%. We did the 24 inch down Riverside. The balance of it was the PRV because there's two separate systems. There's an Eastern and a Western system. So you're basically building two full facilities, but it, it shouldn't take more than about four months. We have everything. We ordered it all prior to being uh, the stop notice. Okay. Okay. Do we have any public comment, other public comment, either in the room or online? We do not. Okay. I would look then for a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Tammy, would you please call the roll? Or the vote. Director Torres? Yep. Director Denstead? Yes. Director Roten? Yes. Director Rizvi? Yes. President Gardner? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries five to zero. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next item is um, to approve or consider approving a joint community facilities agreement between Riverside uh, Unified School District, Pulte Home Companies, Inc., or LLC, and Western Municipal Water District. And it says that this is Mr. Kawai again. Again, it's Derek. This, this went to the engineering committee. We have uh, two joint facilities agreements. We'll take them uh, one, one at a time. Uh, Derek, can you give us the update on 8B, please, first? Sure. So this item is to approve Western's participation in a joint community facilities agreement to set up the uh, CFD number 40 administrated by Riverside Unified School District. The impacted residential tract is located at the intersection of El Monte Road and McAllister Street at the foot of Lake Matthews Dam. The CFD will be will finance part of Western's water and sewer capacity charges for each home within the tract, as well as the cost to construct water and sewer pipelines. The total cost of these fees to be financed is um, including facilities is six million seven hundred thirty three thousand one hundred seventy nine dollars. The approval of this agreement has no significant cost impact on Western because the capacity fees will be the capacity fees that are due will be paid by the developer regardless 
of how they choose to finance that cost and the water and sewer pipelines will be contributed to Western as a condition of providing service. The requested action is to authorize the general manager to execute an agreement entitled Joint Community Facilities Agreement between Riverside Unified School District, Pulte Homes Company, LLC, a Michigan limited liability company, and Western Municipal Water District. Now in this meeting, we have virtually uh, Patrick um, Lehman of Pulte Group, and we have John Zimmerman, um, who was a consultant to the Pulte Group um, of the Zimmerman Group. I now invite any questions you might have. Okay, any questions from board members? Uh, Director Roten. Um, I have one, and it's probably more to the process of these joint CFDs as opposed to this particular project. But I found it interesting that um, Western's name doesn't show on the eventual resident's um, tax bill. And it, again, I'm sure this is like part of the process, but in transparency, if I were purchasing a home and I know that I'm going to have, I don't know if these are still called Mellow Roos fees, but Basically. that I was going to have those, I would want to know who they were going to. And I know that the, the process is all, it's spelled out, it's very detailed, it's, you know, we have to, we go through all of this um, at meetings and approvals and all of that kind of thing. But I just found it that that was interesting and I didn't know if there was a reason behind it. Why well, I can try and tackle that one. So my <laughs> who experience- Who wants to answer that? Derek, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. I can answer it or Derek, go ahead. Sure, I was just going to be essentially I, say my experience I'm sorry, with this is that for the, interrupting, but we have a freeze on Zoom. Nope. We're frozen on my end. We're frozen. I can hear you. And I mean, you're good. Me. You're good. All right, uh, thank you. as well. Go ahead. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, Derek. Okay, great. So my experience on doing CFDs um, is that when you set up a community facilities district, you have to have a sponsoring agency, and the sponsoring agency has to be the one that has the largest amount of facilities that are to be financed. So in this case, it's the school district that stepped up and wanted to uh, be the sponsor and they do all the processing of the of the joint community facilities district that is set up as a part of this action. Um, we are essentially signing on to be part of that and our facilities are, are we will notice them as being eligible, but really it's that the school district that's in charge of this CFD and that's why their name is the one that shows up. Okay. I'm good. So the taxes will be paid to the school district. It's just that the fees that come from the, those bond proceeds will be paid, uh, will pay for- Connection. Uh, connection fees for the, for the district. Right, mm -hmm. so is there a way for the ultimate purchaser of that home to know that? Is that documented anywhere when they purchase the home or? I, I don't I, think it's required I, to be. I, I would guess that it's in the escrow uh, documents. Kevin has an opinion. And 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 just for the process, because I have I have made these calls and I have gone through this process myself on our particular CFD f that sits on my property at my residence and. Um, when you call up that number, they will give you a breakdown. Oh, I so okay. the lead agency is the one that's responsible for giving you and providing you with the information of the breakdown of where all of those fees go. And that's why their telephone number is put in there. So um, they will be the essential administrator of providing that information and documentation should someone want to get further breakdown. But yes, it is in the escrow documents. Yes, it is considered a Melarus. Yes, it does you know, show all the tax value that is going into that because your tax value starts off at, you know, what, 1.1, mm -hmm. and then this is increased, most of them go up to 1.8, 1.9, um, because of these bonds that are issued out. Okay, all right, I'm, I feel a little better knowing that there is a breakdown available to, um, to folks, not that they might know to look for it, but at least it's there, so yeah, appreciate and, that information. And, and just to give some back history, for CFDs, 
Uh, Western took a position a long, long time ago to never be the lead agency, to have stuff come to us and not for us to be the initiating because of the way that this rolls out. And we didn't, at the time, have enough staff to be able to keep track and field all those types of calls. So it gets sent off to the lead agency and, and the tax office to be able to break all those things down. So, um, but things have changed over the years too. So, you know, but we, we had that discussion years ago. Okay. Other questions or comments? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll wait. Okay. So basically, we are just providing, we are getting money and providing for the services, right? For connection services. How are we involved in that? So, so um, development has to pay for the water infrastructure and buying into the existing system. They have to pay either way. So this is really just a way that the developer can finance this differently. Okay. So they can either um, write us a check for those facilities and we can build them. They can build those facilities themselves and donate it to us afterwards. <laughs> this is just a way for them to recover the cost from taxes rather than putting it into the sales price of the home. So either way, the homeowner's paying for it. The, in this case, they're gonna pay for it over time in taxes combined with school fees and other things. So either way, we get our money so that we're whole. It's just the way it's, it's collected from the homeowner. Okay. Director Torres? Yes. So um, I, I was gonna, a I'm asking, um, the house, this house tract, um, how many homes will be on it? Did the guy leave? Uh, it's, on the, it's on the graphic right there, 272. I'm, oh, I, oh my gosh, right there, okay, 272. <laughs> and why is it RUSD that is on the CFD instead of the county, or is it because of this, it goes to school fees? Derek? Sure. The, um, basically, the, uh, in this case, the school district has the largest amount of facilities that are being financed, whether they be connection capacity fees or actual physical infrastructure. They, they're the largest, and that's the way the law is written, that it has to be the largest um, agency is the one that has to um, run the, the facility. Is there someone here from the school district? I do not believe so. The two representatives that we have are from um, the de representing the developer. So uh, procedurally, that means that their board has already approved this? I, I don't know. Is, oh, is, no, is there... um, actually their board has, the, their, their school board will have to act on this. Uh, I think actually the, the next one, the school, the, the, when we do the city one, the, their city board still has to act on it. I believe in the case of the school district, school district has already acted because this is the, the form of this has already been decided. Okay, those are my questions. Okay, and check one more time. Any other public comment? I see no request to speak. Okay, I would look for a motion then. I'll move to approve. I have a motion, is there a second? Second. Motion and a second, any discussion? Hearing none, Tammy, would you please take the vote? Thank you, Director Torres? Yes. Director Dinstead? Director Roten? Yes. Director Rizvi? Yes. President Gardner? Aye. Thank you, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, thank you very much. We should make a note that Director Denstedt voted in favor of a CFD. <laughs> I, I paused, pause I pause. really paused, <laughs> I really paused. Record. I know, I think staff is gonna be pause. celebrating today. <laughs> Not the first time. Mm. <laughs> Okay, our next item, um, 8C, is another um, community facilities agreement, this one between the City of Riverside, um, 103LP, and Western. And it's Derek again. Go ahead, Derek. Okay, great, thank you. So this one is another, uh, is no, another joint community facilities district. Um, I might add that staff str um, strives to be neutral in all of these, so we will not be celebrating. <laughs> Um, so as far as this particular item, this one is for the city of Riverside. 
um, and it's con it's it's entitled Community Facilities District Number um, 2021-3. The impacted residential tract is located south of Learn Avenue, immediately south of Western's Learn Reservoirs. The CFD will finance part of Western's water and sewer capacity charges for each home within the tract. The total cost of these fees to be financed is $2,692,133. The approval of this agreement has no significant cost impact on Western because the capacity fees due um, will be paid by the developer regardless of how they choose to finance that cost. The agreement is similar in form to the CFD agreements that Western has previously entered into with the exceptions of edit edits from the City of Riverside um, that they've requested in order to clarify that the CFD reimbursements are processed by Western and paid to the developer through Western. So that adds another couple of steps of the process. Just procedurally, it's still the city that ultimately has to approve everything. So um, developer will submit the paperwork to Western. Western will be doing the checks, uh, checks of making sure all the math is right, submitting it over to the city. And then the city will be ultimately approving and then authorizing the CFD to issue the money from the bonds proceeds to Western and Western will send it to the um, to the developer. The requested action is to authorize the general manager to execute a, an agreement entitled Joint Community Facilities Agreement relating to CFD number 2021-3, um, friends, Bridal Ridge, at, of the city of Riverside. In this, um, in this meeting, we have present Manju um, Pakhare Ralal, um, and she is manager um, of the um, financial group, um, development and planning financial group. She is representing the developer, Legacy Homes. Um, I invite any of your questions. Okay. Are there questions from board members? <clears throat> Do we have any requests to speak either in the room or online? We do not. Okay, I would look then for a motion. So move. I'll second. Okay. And a second by Director Rizvi. Actually, can I ask one question? Go ahead. Sorry. The tax rate, it says approximately 1.59. Has it been, has the calculation been done and is that what it's going to stay at? I might have to turn to the developer's representative on this one. I can say in general, um, I've seen this before where the tax rate is just an estimate because it really just depends on the time of sale of the bonds. And so we have an estimate based on what we think the bonds will sell at, sell at um, but we don't know until the actual sales go through. Okay, was there any comment from the developer? Um, good, good morning, this is Mantu. Good morning. So the, the tax rate, it's approximate because the tax rates have already been set. But what changes is the property value at the sale, when the homes close, at the price they close at and all the other tax rates, the ad valorem rates, the fixed assessments, they change. So we can't say it's going to be 1.59 it all depends on all of those factors but it would be close to the 1.59 rate okay thank you very much appreciate that sure any other questions if not tammy would you please call the roll director torres yes director denstead aye director roten yes Director Rizvi? Yes. President Gardner? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries five to zero. Okay, thank you. 8D is to consider rejection of all bids for the construction of the Cannon Pump Station interconnection with Riverside Public Utilities, uh, Project W285. And Derek, it looks like you're still on, unless Mr. Miller, you want to say something before I um, turn it over. The only thing I would add is this went to our engineering committee. We had a lengthy discussion, including the two of the bidders were there to 
um, talk about the bid environment and the cost increases that they're seeing typically in all of their bids, mm -hmm. uh, which we don't disagree with, but that's not why we're rejecting the bids. So Derek, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to go over the presentation again with the full board. Great, thank you. So this item is related to Western's initiative to construct interconnections with our adjacent agencies to allow local water to be transported throughout our region. In this case, the Cannon Pump Station and interconnection with Riverside Public Utilities Project is designed to deliver local groundwater to Western. Staff advertised the construction of the project for public bidding on October 25th, 2022. The apparent low bid price was $19,256,000, which is approximately 30% higher than the engineer's opinion of probable cost, which was estimated at $14,775,000. Uh, sorry, $14,775,000. The bid, the bid appeared to be competitive and fair. We, we, we went through and we analyzed it. The bidders spoke at the engineering committee, um, just as, just as Craig mentioned, um, and they concurred with staff. The cost increase was due to recent shortages of materials, parts, equipment, and labor resources. The bids were substantially higher than anticipated. Um, and that caused staff to reevaluate the process, um, the project, because it's significantly above what with the budget and I, the budget that we had set aside for this particular project. Um, and the thing is, is that what we want to do is reject all of the bids for the construction of this project um, at this time. And we would look to potentially re-advertising this at a later day when the market is stabilized. The anticipated construction costs are more consistent with the engineer's cost estimate. And of course, prior to rebidding, we would not bid the exact same project. We would be looking to do some value engineering to potentially reduce the cost uh, without critical impacts to the overall functionality. <clears throat> Western also has a, another interconnection project with the city of Riverside. Um, it's proposed at the Magnolia Avenue, um, a, a near a connection where we connect directly with the city of Riverside. And it's near where you, you might know the Sterling pump station. So we would be able to get water in from Riverside um, at that particular location. We'll be bringing this project forward to the board for consideration in the near future. So there are other ways that we can do interconnections. Um, so the request at this time is for the board to reject all bids for the construction of the Cannon Pump Station and interconnection with Riverside Public Utilities Project, which was specification W-285. We do have um, present virtually uh, Mr. Peter Kogler. Um, he is the division manager of SCW Contracting. They were one of the bidders. Um, and I did speak to him um, just before the meeting and um, he did indicate he didn't really have any comments. He just was interested in seeing the item um, as, as it what the result is. Um, this concludes my comments and I invite any questions. Great. Are there questions from board members? Yeah. Yes, I have a quick question. This is, um, in my opinion, just very unfortunate, obviously not our fault that the economy and inflation, everything's um, going so um, difficult for folks, including in this industry. Um, what are we doing to mitigate this? Um, I know other agencies have taken are adding a 30% or you know something of some type of buffer to their engineers reports because this is not going to change very anytime soon uh, where we're, we're getting bids that are outside of our, our own estimate. So how, how what is the course of action? Yeah, so um, th this this as the economy fluctuates over the years, this has always been an issue. Um, and there will be times when the engineer's estimates are lower than the bids and time when they're higher than the bids. We've, we've actually had some other projects that have come in right at the engineer's estimate still. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't disagree with the contractors who came in and you know, represented, I think, fairly that inflation has gone up dramatically since this engineer's estimate was developed. Um, if In this case... Um, if, if we were very confident in the project and it was strictly that our engineer's estimate was low, sure. we would have come back. I would have come back to the board and said, there's been a lot of inflation. Let's just go ahead. Even though it's higher, we need this project right now. And we would have advocated for it. 
because we're not tied to the engineer's estimate. That's just something that we use for budgeting purposes and you know, our long-term financial planning. But in this case, this project has had dramatic increases from the time it was conceptualized. So this isn't the first big increase. And so when we sat down as a staff, I started asking the fundamental questions again, like what's the need of the project? What's the purpose of the project? Does the business case still stand up sure. for this project? And we all, we all agree that it really doesn't right now. And so as Derek mentioned, we think that we can go back and eliminate some elements of the project and reconsider bidding it again. And like Derek mentioned, we have another connection with RPU. So this would be a third connection with RPU to get water from their system that we wheel through their system or they wheel for us through their system. Well, we're developing an, a third connection. So I think the urgency of this project is not as urgent as when we it's first- It's not as present. Yeah, as when we first conceptualized the project because the Magnolia connection staff working very closely with RPU staff figured out that, well, that's a little more convenient and it works really well uh, for RPU. So all those things together, I just don't think it's worth a $19 million project right now. So I feel like we should, my recommendation is reject it, let staff go back and Re rethink the project. We may come back, we may not come back, mm -hmm. um, but I just don't think it's worth this district spending $19 million right now. And with the grant funding that was tied to it, that's going to be shifting to a different The grant project? funding, we have shifted that grant funding around before. So Ryan and his team have been really good at that. So we'll look for that opportunity. But it's hard to leave grant money on the table. Yeah. And so that may be, that'll definitely be part of the decision process if we repackage this project and come back. But we're also, I'll give you a warning, what makes us nervous is we're bumping up against time limits on that funding. So we are in a little bit of a, uh, a predicament, but I don't think it's uh, worth $19 million right now. Okay, Director Ruzzi? Oops, I'm sorry. Any other questions, comments? Do we have anyone online who would like to comment? I see no requests. Okay, look for a motion then. I'll make the motion. We have a motion. The motion to? Uh, to re reject all bids in, uh, of the construction of the cannon pump station in connection with RPU uh, <laughs> W285. I'll second the motion. Okay, motion and second. Is there any discussion? Tammy, would you please call the roll? Thank you. Director Torres? Yes. Director Denstedt? Aye. Director Roten? Yes. Director Rizvi? Yes. President Gardner? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries five to zero. Okay, thank you. This brings us to our annual confirmation of Western Director's representation to outside organizations. Um, I filled out our, what we call the matrix, um, after talking to each of the directors and what is before you is my recommendation, I have done my best to accommodate everything that each of you asked for. Um, I think we are very close. And at this point, um, obviously I, I need to see if Mr. Miller or Mr. Ballinger have anything to say, but our purpose is to discuss as appropriate the proposed um, assignments that are on the sheet in front of us um, and adopt something, whether it's that or a modification of it. So. Well, I, this is up to the board, board president, um, but the only thing I would say is that we are obligated to do this in January, and so this is um, the opportunity to discuss it, and uh, this, I think we're following the typical process that we always follow where um, the uh, board president reaches out to the board members ask for their input on what uh, committees they'd like to represent on. And so I think this is uh, working very similar to how it's always worked. So we, we do need to make a decision this month. Okay, Mr. Ballinger, did you want to add anything? I concur. Okay. Um, do we have any discussion amongst board members? 
Um, no, but I do have a, a request, and I don't know if who I need to ask it to, but I, I did text you about the Temesco Valley MAC. Um, two things um, just for consideration is one, Director Denstan's uh, load, committee load, um, it, and it's always been, you know, um, pretty heavy as, uh, as you know, it is her, um, you know, as I'm, I'm sure she enjoys doing. Um, but I would, I would request that I be the primary on that. Um, I'll be attending those meetings. That, that is where I like to be. Very rarely am I able to, um, you know, not have to take or move things around to do evening meetings. And so that is one that I would... Um, I would appreciate being the primary of, and um, you know, of course, if uh, Director Danstead would be the alternate, um, and uh, as well as that being a new uh, area in my division, one that I I really want to take the time to get to know better and and connect with the community out there, um, and of course, in doing so, um, be compensated um, if 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 um, if possible. I'm get, assuming these are all um, part of the. Um, part of our board ordinance. Um, so that's my only request. Um, you know, if, if we look at the, um, if you're looking at the matrix, most of our, uh, most of the board has a very balanced um, committee um, load and Director Denstez is very heavy. So one, uh, help her alleviate it, but two, it, I, it, it, it is for me. I, I would really like to, um, because of, of the availability, I'm available, but also, um, get to know that area a little bit better. Okay, that, um, it, my thinking in suggesting uh, the primary and the alternate was just the amount of the area that is represented um, geographically, the number of people may be different, but I don't have data to show that really. Um, I don't know how Director Denstedt feels about that. Um. Oh, Mr. President, I'm happy to comment on that. Um, I have represented the Temesco Valley for a number of years. That still is an area of representation, Horse Thief Canyon, and a variety of different areas still fall within the Temesco Valley MAC. And I have had a conversation with a number of individuals that sit on that MAC that have asked for my continued participation in there. So I'm happy to accommodate those folks since I have a standing relationship with them. And I'm happy to serve in that capacity. So. Okay. Um, just as a matter of clarification, it's, it's my impression that this is a recommendation by whoever is serving as president, but it's actually a, an action of the board to approve whatever it is that gets approved. Um, so it, it sounds as though we have two board members who would like to be the primary representative to the, um, this particular MAC. Um, and I think the board is going to have to make a decision as to which one they, they wish to put there. Um, Director Rizvi did serve on that MAC previously and, and volunteered to step back to make room because when we did redistrict, um, Division Two picked up a, a piece of the area that was not part of Division Two previously. Um, and I, honestly, I understand everyone's recommend, everyone's arguments and their, their feelings. Um, Director Roten and I do not represent any piece of that area, so there was never any discussion of, of us being assigned to it, but we do have three directors who represent portions of it. Director Rizvi um, took herself out of the running for that one. Um, so I don't know how the board would like to approach this. We, we could look at a variety of, of things. I, I don't know if we have any information on number of, of people in that geographic area that are in Division Two or Division Three, which could be a guideline. Geographically, Division Three does have a larger piece. Um, we could also look at how many committee assignments 
each director has, and that might be some guidance for some of us. Um, so I don't know. Do we do we have any idea, um, Mr. Miller, how many people? I'm going to pull out my phone and pull out Google Map because if you're looking at density, and I also use some uh, some of the voter reg, but th which doesn't matter because you can right. have you know 200 million people in one area and only six voters, but. Um, if you if you just do a quick Google Earth search, um, the population seems to be fall the higher population. Again, my interest is to get to know that community a lot better. Um, you know, I aside from campaigning, that was my real introduction out there, and so that's my interest. Um, I I had been with director um, with director uh, Rizvi to a few of the MAC meetings, and I would like to continue to do so. I'm going to continue to do so. I, um, I'm not, you know, it, it's not about that. Um, it's not about whether I'm allowed to or not. I'll go regardless. But um, I think because of, of the number of, of people that I represent, me wanting to be introduced to the area, which it sounds like Director Dunstead already has, um, and build also build on, on those relationships so that I can serve effectively, that's my only interest. Um, and again, I've, I, I don't know how... I, I'm looking at Director Denstad's load, and it's heavy. It's incredibly heavy. Um, I know that you know there's uh, been several reasons for that, and I'm I'm appreciative of the fact that she's willing to take something like I mean so much on. Um, and so that's just one that I would I would ask to alleviate or or switch. I guess that's for lack of better terms. Okay. Um, are there any other suggested assignments that? Um, anyone has questions or comments on? Okay, hearing none. Um, and, and I will just point out that the matrix includes the Metropolitan Water District assignment. Um, and we have a separate vote that we need to take on that, which is our next item. So the action that we'll take on the matrix now is everything but Metropolitan Water District. You might consider taking a vote on the, this one uh, uh, assignment separately from the rest of the matrix. That's one possibility. That, yeah. Another possibility is that, could, that may be the most expeditious way of, of determining um, that issue. So I, I don't know if people want to make further argument as to why they should be the person or if somebody, someone would like to make a motion. I'll make a motion to oh. adopt. Oh, can, I'm sorry. Can I make just, I just have one question. So on the Temescal Valley, it, whether you're the uh, assigned person or the alternate doesn't, do I understand, does not preclude you from attending the meeting that any any of us Correct. actually could? Or, right. or participating. No, uh, absolutely okay. not. But it does, uh, it does um, infringe on our, on our stipend. And so... Yeah. Um, I'm going to be going anyways. I'd like to be there um, and actually represent it and be the one that, um, you know, gives the updates when updates are, are given. Okay. Well, and just one additional comment. Um, since there's been comments about the load um, and the assignments, uh, I will stand on my record of attendance for all of the things that I've ever been assigned to that I have uh, very rarely missed a meeting on my time serving in these capacities on this board for my entire 16 years here. So um, I'm happy to make a motion to move this item and take President's recommendations for committee assignments. And Except Metropolitan Water District. Correct. Yes. Correct. Which, which is a separate item to be voted on on the next item on the agenda. Okay, we, we have a motion that. and I'll second. I'm sorry. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? No, doesn't sound like she wants to switch. <laughs> okay, it looks like no further discussion. Um, so I will call for the vote. Director Torres? Yes. Director Denstead? Aye. Director Roten? Yes. Director Rizvi? Yes. President Gardner? Aye. 
Thank you. The motion carries five to zero. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and I, I, I'm sorry that we have this this conflict, but there there is an opportunity for you know, both the the primary member and the alternate to appear and participate. And although one person is the primary representative um, and, and would normally be called on the alternate if they are present always has an opportunity to, to speak. Um, so I'm- Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, I understand. I'm, you know, I'm, I asked nicely and of course it was up to her, so. No, I, I understand and I wanna thank all of you for your, your work on this. Um, some people made some sacrifices um, and that made it easier for me. So I thank you for that. And that then brings us to the appointment of the Metropolitan Water District representative. Um, my recommendation is to uh, keep uh, Director Denstedt as our representative. She has done, I think, a good job for us there. Um, it is a time and travel intensive yeah. um, assignment and one that I don't, I don't want to take on. <laughs> um, so my recommendation is to retain um, Director Denstedt as the Western representative to the Metropolitan Water District. I have a comment before a motion is made. While I understand that you know she might have the most time or ability to be there, I do have to object to um, her 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 staying on this board. We have a lot of work to do with Metropolitan Water District. One example is the Rubido line that we didn't get granted a year at versus five years. And my understanding is um, it had a lot to do with the relationships that have been built on that board. Um, uh, another example is her bid for secretary did not go over well, and it shows the level of support. We all know, and, and <coughs> I'm one of those, that we need to, to get along with our board members in order to get things done. And I might not be the best example um, if that's the case, but when we, get, we don't get updates um, from uh, regular updates um, or even our opinion and uh, work on, on these votes that are taking place, um, instead, rather, we get gossip or opinions. Um, there was an objection to the board chair who she needs to work with, and, um, and then the a project labor agreement, which we were not taken into consideration for. Um, while I know that um, um, the, these things matter, one thing that, um, and this was brought up to me by employees of Metropolitan Water District and their association, um, that their concerns that we as a, as a region or as an area here in Riverside uh, County cannot um, get what we need if we have a board member that um, uh, is not to get along with the 38 board members um, that, that serve with her. Um, and then the last concern that I heard were that tours are meant for ratepayers and not once, um, and, and that the last one that was there was not um, extended to ratepayers, and so people are concerned about, about that, about um, not getting the opportunity that MET gives um, ratepayers to take those tours. Um, so that's my objection. I'm, you know, I, I don't have another recommendation, but I did want to state it for the record. Okay, are there other board comments? And, and let me ask if there's any public comment. There is not. Okay, any other board comments or a motion? Um, I would like the, to make the emotion, the emotion. Where did that come from? The motion to um, continue with Director Denstedt as our representative to MET. Uh, MET is probably the appointment that has the largest learning curve. And I know that Director Denstedt has immersed herself in that and is, I feel, representing Western um, looking out for our best interests at MET. We may or may not always agree with the majority of folks that are voting, but that's gonna happen a lot in a 38-member board. 
So um, I've always seen Director Denstep being professional and prepared and um, looks into things and asks questions. So I feel that uh, she would continue as a, a good representative for Western. Therefore, my motion. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Yes, I will second the motion. And uh, just to make a few comments, uh, the Rubido thing, uh, Western's representatives are prohibited under the administrative code for Metropolitan to be able to participate in any of the discussions because had I been able to participate in the discussions and not being conflicted out, I believe that that would have passed very successfully with my ability to be able to advocate on behalf of our agency, which ties my hands. Um, as far as my bid for the secretary, that was a nomination from one of my colleagues, not my own nomination for that position, of which people told me afterwards had they not already committed a vote and had known that it was going to be a nomination of me, they would have voted for me instead of the current representative who I have a relationship with and I'm happy to support uh, Ms. Fong Sakai from San Diego. Um, as far as the project labor agreement was concerned, actually, uh, I collaborated with all of our chambers in the region to have that discussion with the project labor agreement for Western on the benefit of its customers. And the project labor agreements were absolutely a part of certainly Riverside Chambers um, business plan that they object to all project labor agreements. And the fact of the matter is, is that by doing the project labor agreement, um, it actually increased Met's budget by over $6 million to bring somebody in to manage that um, in order to push projects through that, which was, in my opinion, unnecessary and continued to put a burden on our customers to have to come up with an additional $6 million that was not in the budget for Metropolitan to move forward a project labor agreement that and bring in a management company to facilitate that. So. I didn't see the necessity and I agreed with the chambers and I certainly advocated with our chambers who we are business partners with to not continue to burden our customers with additional funding that doesn't need to be done. Um, the projects would have moved forward on their own merit and they would have been managed under their own construction agreements and that $6 million was added to the budget unnecessarily in my opinion and I voted on behalf of our customers to represent that um, unnecessary expense. So and to support our chambers and what they believed project labor agreements don't benefit their businesses. So um, that's in response and I appreciate the comments from my colleague. Um, this has been a, a tremendous lift. It's been a tremendous challenge. Um, our last board packet was almost 2,000 pages. It takes quite some time uh, to read that because Metropolitan staff puts it out there um, at the very last second, and I got to keep up with that caseload and reading all the materials and asking the questions that I need to ask prior to going to all those meetings. So I do appreciate your comments, Director Roden. Thank you. Okay, any additional comments? I just want to say that I, any, everything that I got and I listed it came from staff and uh, people that are have a high interest in um, that board, so not my, not my own opinion. Okay, um, there's no more discussion. I would call for the vote, please. Director Torres? No. Director Dinstedt? Aye. Director Roten? Yes. Director Risby? Yes. President Gardner? Aye. Thank you, the motion carries four to one with Director Torres voting no. I, I would just point out that in my experience, Western has never, the board has never given direction to a representative to another agency how to vote. We are appointed to represent Western, but I, I do not recall an instance where this board has said, Director, representative to Chino Basin Watermaster, vote this way on that item. No, it's um, usually staff. 
So just, just an observation. We, we act as we think best as the appointees. So thank everyone for your input on this one. Um, and that concludes our business items. Um, reports, General Counsel. Uh, yes, President, members of the board, um, uh, staff and I will be meeting later on today and I'll be able to provide uh, the board with an update on AB 2449, which is a pretty significant amendment to the Brown Act that allows for um, uh, extended uh, meetings uh, by teleconference and video conference. So I'll have a more thorough report for you at the next board meeting, but I want to alert you to that. Uh, if you have any questions about it specifically, feel free to reach out to me or staff individually. Uh, Are you in saying it's being extended? Or it, it extended the previous? It extends the authority to uh, provide for kind of more liberalized um, teleconferencing. So AB 361 uh, is still in effect uh, and still allows for teleconf liberalized teleconferencing during the state of an emergency or during emergency circumstances. Uh, but as the governor is gonna be uh, repealing his uh, declared state of emergency this next month, um, as, a, as a practical matter, AB 361 is not gonna be able to be utilized. AB 2449 will be uh, even in the absence of an emergency or, or a dangerous situation. Oh. It's a new bill, uh, and yes, it basically extends the authority to uh, uh, have more liberalized teleconferencing, even in the absence of a declared state of emergency. And, and Okay, well, I guess I'll wait till you give the full. Yeah, and if you have questions in the meantime, please feel free to raise them with me or staff. That way we can make sure to address them in, in my presentation at the next board meeting. Right. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Did you have anything else, Mr. Bellinger? Uh, not for me, no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Miller. <laughs> um, I, I just have two short things because I want to get to the... Um, drought and water supply update, which I think the board will find very, very interesting. Um, Western is participating in the 2023 Inland Empire Heart and Stroke Walk. So the Western staff is participating, and um, I don't want to be competitive, but if the board wanted to participate, they could have their own little team, but we'll see. Up to you. Let us know if you want to participate, but we're looking forward to the walk and uh, raising some funds for the Heart Association. Uh, March 25th is the walk, and uh, if you want information, Candy has Candy Judd has the information available. I can forward it to the board. Thank you. Um, and then just an update: um, Lois Krieger and Don Galliano were both honored uh, last week at Lake Matthews. A really nice ceremony. It was a beautiful day, and both of their plaques were unveiled, uh, Don uh, the, renamed the Overlook for Don Galliano and the Nature Reserve for Lois Krieger. So it was a beautiful, beautiful event. And that concludes my comments, unless there are questions. Any questions for the general manager? Oops. Thank you, sir. And okay, let's get on to Water the supply. fun part. It's actually been raining, if you haven't been paying attention. Really? We've had an extremely wet period, so, uh, I'm turning it over to Ryan, I believe, yep. uh, first, and he's going to share the presentation with Michelle, uh, but Ryan. Thanks, Craig. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm finally here with uh, some good news. Um, as Craig said, it's been raining and snowing uh, cats and dogs, so thank you for doing your uh, rain dance. Uh, next slide. One more, please. So uh, local precip, um, we are almost double what we typically have in terms of the Santa Ana watershed, uh, about almost 14 inches. Typically, we end up with 15 to 17 total for the whole year, uh, so a really good start. Next slide. Um, so um, DWR does a monthly snow survey, and you see that they're taking their survey there in the picture on the right. But the, the table, I want to draw your attention to the green and orange. That's a snow pack from the last two years. Uh, recall last, uh, I guess it would be December 2021, uh, we had a ton of snow, and then it was the driest three months following that. 
So we're kind of in the same boat. And you can see uh, Carla, Carla named this um, quote there that we're not quite out of the woods yet, but off to a really good start. Yeah. Next slide. So in terms of uh, precipitation up in the Sierras, uh, you can see the blue line there, uh, well on track, uh, currently at 158% of average, but tracking with some of the uh, wettest, wettest years on record. So fingers crossed uh, that continues. And that was as of yesterday. Next slide. So uh, snowpack for Sierra and the Colorado River also doing very well, tracking um, very similar to last year. But you'll notice uh, the white lines uh, following uh, the, the wet um, December from last year, it kind of uh, tabled out a little bit. Um, so hopefully uh, that snowpack sticks around uh, and we continue to get some more storms coming uh, in the next couple months. Next slide. So this one's a little bit different. Um, you've seen this in, in um, prior years, but um, this is a graphic showing all the major reservoirs up and down the state. And the six mega re reservoirs uh, you'll see are um, highlighted with a black line around them. Uh, Shasta, Oroville, San Luis. Uh, and actually Craig uh, uh, found this snapshot on Fox News the other night um, showing um, the percentage increase in these big reservoirs up and down the state starting kind of back in um, Christmas time. And you see the percentage increase goes from 34% up to 42% uh, as of last week, which is great. Uh, it was even, um, I believe, below 30% uh, around Christmas time. So it's a ton of water that um, we're, are filling up these reservoirs, but you'll notice the last bullet there, 68%. Uh, is normal, 68% full for all these reservoirs. So um, really good start. Uh, we're going the right direction, but we still have a long way to go. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a chart uh, that we borrowed from Metropolitan Water District uh, showing Lake Orville storage. And you can see um, where the light blue is current year storage and uh, the dark blue on the right-hand side was last year's storage. And you'll see kind of right in the middle, there's uh, a marker there. 1.6 million acre feet um, is how much was in Lake Orville uh, as of a couple months ago. Uh, but, um, and these numbers are already outdated. So we, Lake Orville has already gotten more than 500,000 acre feet foot gain uh, from these recent storms, putting us over 2 million acre feet. So that's a really good indicator. Uh, for the state water project allocation that we'll likely see in the coming months. The 1.6 million acre feet uh, line there is what uh, DWR estimates they need for regulatory and non-state water project contractor needs. So not even at the end of January, having 2 million acre feet in Orville is a, a really good start. Next slide. Um, so uh, despite all this uh, great <laughs> rain and snow, uh, you've seen this chart in the past. Um, a couple of highlights here. The Colorado River supply, the, the block on the bottom, you'll notice it's kind of hovering around 800, 850,000 acre feet of Colorado River supply. You may recall in prior months, uh, that was up at around 1.1 million acre feet. Um, so this is an indicator that MET um, is planning to uh, provide some of the Colorado River supply for uh, the conservation contributions uh, that they're going to have to uh, provide uh, to the river. Uh, the other um, item of note is the state water project supply, the second block. That's actually all uh, human health and safety water. And if you re recall, this is water that we're basically uh, getting on loan. It has to be repaid back to the state within a five-year period. So it's great that we have uh, the supplies available to us, but Metropolitan's going to have to repay that back um, within a five-year period. And then lastly, uh, because of that, um, Colorado River supply dropped from about 1.1 million acre feet to 850,000. You'll see the top bar in red. Um, that's the supply demand gap that Metropolitan has to meet uh, by pulling water from storage. Um, uh, they have a variety of uh, surface and groundwater storage um, reservoirs up and down the state. And it's at 575,000 acre feet, whereas maybe a month or two ago, that was at 325,000 acre feet. So substantial uh, swing in terms of how much water uh, MED is gonna have to pull from storage. 
Next slide. Um, last week at Metropolitan's board, uh, they actually, can we go back one? Thanks. Uh, last week at Met's board, there was a, a lengthy discussion um, and the, the board approved $100 million um, uh, for uh, wet water transfers, uh, mostly up in Northern California. Uh, in a really wet year like this, uh, it's a really good market uh, to buy um, water, surplus water from Northern California agencies. Um, so Met's gonna be very aggressive uh, this year um, and get out in the market and try and uh, purchase as much water as they can, um, not only to meet um, current demands, but also to start um, refilling all their storage reservoirs up and down the state. Uh, as you saw in that last slide, they're draining quite a bit of storage. Um, so they're gonna be very aggressive uh, this coming year. Next slide. So where does that leave us uh, in terms of a water supply allocation plan? Um, as a reminder, this is uh, Met's plan uh, to allocate um, water um, in times of uh, drought. So Met has basically told us even with a 50, 60, 70% state water project allocation that they're likely gonna um, implement their own uh, water supply allocation plan. So uh, this graphic just shows you kind of the, the timetable over the last 15 years. Um, Metropolitan and its member agencies developed the, the water supply allocation plan back in 2008 and have had to implement it three times uh, since then, 2009, 2010, um, and 2015, excuse me, in the last drought. And typically the way this works is um, Met will take a look at the DWR um, monthly um, updates on snowpack uh, in the state water project allocation each month, uh, January, February, March, April, and usually take some action sometime around May for implementation, uh, typically starting July 1 of the fiscal year. So even with a great uh, wet year, uh, we're still planning uh, to be in an allocation for Metropolitan. So uh, next slide, please. So actually right now uh, is the first uh, Metropolitan Member Agency uh, monthly meeting on the water supply allocation plan. Uh, so Western and um, has staff attending that. And we're also having uh, monthly meetings uh, with our member agencies to pass along this information. Um, as you know, uh, a number of our member agencies purchase um, Metropolitan water. So uh, what we've done in the past and we'll likely do this time is um, just pass along the allocation uh, the methodology, the calculation that Met comes up with, they give Western an allocation, and we basically divvy that up with all of our imported water member agencies. Uh, so the formula is the same, um, but uh, more to come on that. Um, we'll keep you updated each month, but we're planning for a, an allocation um, starting July 1. And then the last thing I had, and then I'll flip it over to, to Michelle, um, um, along with this allocation uh, that we will likely see, we'll have to come back to the board um, and move into a higher um, um, drought contingency stage. Right now, if you recall, we're still in stage two. Uh, depending on the allocation level uh, that MET puts out there, we may uh, recommend to go into a stage three, uh, possibly a stage four. But that's all part of our drought uh, response program, so stay tuned. I'll pass it on to Michelle. Great, thank you, Ryan. Um, again, Michelle Adams, your customer experience manager. I get to come alongside Ryan and hopefully bring the board a little bit of good news. We've had a great um, couple of storms, which is fabulous, um, but we're not out of the emergency yet. And so one of the things that we really wanna focus on is our ongoing outreach and engagement. One of the things that we saw in the last drought was messaging fatigue. So we really wanted to make sure that as we're seeing these storms coming through, as we're going through this sustained drought, that we're actually pivoting our messaging to the, to the messaging that really matters and is really gonna resonate with people and that people are not gonna get fatigued by. So one of the things that we're doing is while we're doing our regional messaging, while we're doing our general service area messaging, Following this storm, we are really gonna focus on what is that direct customer messaging where we can actually get on the phone, in front of people, in the homes and in the businesses to really offer those customer support programs. 
Um, one of the things we hear in our community meetings all the time is, why aren't the big businesses dealing with this? Why don't they have to turn off their water? They have irrigation, they have this, they're using all of our water. We hear that from our residences. We hear it and we're responding to it. So right along with the state, one of the things that we're doing is we are looking at our commercial customers. We're looking at our highest commercial users and we are focusing on them first. So while we have responded to the state's requirement for banning CII non-functional turf watering, we're also coming alongside the state and providing a concierge program. We're actually gonna go out to those CII customers with non-functional turf, help them identify that non-functional turf, help them transform their turf. You guys heard about the pilot program that we just initiated. And then we're also gonna come alongside our homeowners associations. Our homeowners associations are in a unique position right now because their residents are not required to change their front yard landscape. They're not required to required for any cutbacks yet. However, the homeowners associations do have common areas that have non-functional turf. So we are creating a homeowner association concierge program. Again, it really is that white glove service where we are getting in contact with them. We're gonna sit on their boards. We're gonna be a guide for them when they're developing their CCNRs, when they're putting out ordinances for their residents. We wanna be a guide to them to help make sure that not only are we addressing their non-functional turf and decreasing water usage, but we are also providing them guidance for their residents so that they are meeting code requirements, whether county or city, but that they're also meeting the requirements of our water shortage contingency plan. As Ryan mentioned, there is a possibility that we'll be escalating. So we wanna make sure that we're supporting our customers in advance of that escalation. So it's not a surprise, it's not a shock, and it's not we're running behind the eight ball trying to get ahead of it. With the CII Landscape Partnership Pilot Program, that program is specifically focused on five public-private partnerships. So those are gonna be those partnerships where there are the highly visible areas. We're transforming large 5,000 square foot areas of turf in those areas where people have public access and we can put those interpretive signs and everything. So that is different from the CII Concierge Program. Next slide, please. And of course, we cannot forget our residential customers because when the time comes and we do have to escalate our water shortage contingency plan, that is where it's really gonna start to hurt. So we're continuing with our winter drought messaging. As I mentioned, the messaging is still important. We still have to get out there regionally. We still have to get out to our general service area. We still have to support our wholesale agencies in providing messaging and tactics and tools. But we have to be careful with how much we do it because we don't wanna hit that messaging fatigue threshold. So when it comes to the residential customers, we're gonna be looking at our out of budget customers. We're gonna be looking at those customers who are landing in tier three and tier four, and we're gonna pick up the phone, we're gonna give them a call, we're offering them a free survey, and we're gonna offer them again that white glove service. How do we come alongside them and help them fill out that turf rebate application? Find the application on the MET website. How are you installing these? Uh, weather-based irrigation controllers. Director Dunstadt, you talk about the nozzle program all the time. We hear you, and we are going to be making some changes to this program. So as we start looking at this out-of-budget customer engagement campaign, that's exactly what it is. It's not just outreach. We want a two-way conversation with these customers. Next slide, please. So next steps, as Ryan stated, we're gonna be evaluating and making shortage stage recommendations based on what's happening at the state and regional level. So as those mandates are being pushed down, we are going to be responding to that and hopefully in a more proactive manner. We're still currently in stage two, but we are tracking the water shortage or the water supply allocation plan. We wanna be prepared for when met pushes out that plan. We wanna be prepared for these items. We wanna have the winter messaging in our back pocket. We wanna have the out of budget customer campaign already going again, so none of this is a shock to our customers. It's an ongoing conversation. Um, the other thing is we're gonna start preparing an education campaign for the possible implementation of drought fines. So when we head into stage three, one of the things that Western did when we readopted our water shortage contingency plan is we built in drought fines. We didn't wanna impact the water budget. We know people are needing that water in their tier one budget. And yes, we want our city and our county to look beautiful within reason. And so we want them to be able to use their water budget. 
in, uh, in instituting these drought fines, we are focused on those user, users who are not efficient. We're focused on the users who are continuously out of budget, and the drought fine's gonna be a little bit reminder that you're out of budget, it's a drought, come work with Western. And so once again, we're not there yet, but it's very possible we will be there soon and we wanna be prepared. Next slide, please. And with that, um, Ryan and I are here to answer any questions you may have. Does anyone have questions? Uh, just great job. Director Sorry about that. Um, I just had a couple, I, I'm trying to go back to my page folds. Um, and I think they're probably for Ryan. Yeah, they were during his um, first part. Um, on page four, the snow survey, um, I was a little bit surprised, and of course, you know, we hear things in the news or we see things on Facebook. I know they're not always accurate, but from my understanding, Mammoth is, I think, under record snowfall. Now, I, I'm sure this survey is probably taken over a much larger area than just Mammoth, but I was surprised to see that this year we are still below last year's, which kind of shocked yeah, me. Yeah, um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll weigh in on that. Um, so last December was record. Right. So you're comparing this year to what was the highest December ever. So even though it's wet and there's a lot of snowpack this year, that uh, line, sorry, what color was it, the blue line? It, the orange is this year. Can, and can then you go the to, Steve, can you go to slide four? Yeah. Oh, the green line. So the green line is, is last year, and right. at that particular date, uh, yeah, we hadn't matched the wettest or the heaviest snowpack they had ever seen in the Sierras. So I think that's what's happening. It's like the comparison between years is really odd because last year was so, so wet in December, but then it never rained again. Right. And what we're seeing this year is it was almost as wet in December, yet we've had another... 15 days of precipitation and snowfall that we didn't have last year. So that's kind of okay. confusing the, the, the numbers because our numbers lag a little bit. Okay, so perhaps, because I just recently saw the mammoth remark. So, so, now so that, that might not even be on. So it's, not less than, it's less about a region and more about a time thing. So like you said, like the, the time cutoff last year was, it was short and heavy, but now we have a longer, so we're not, we're not meeting that. Basically, our average in the time ways has been has been large has probably been larger, but that's not indicated in the graph. Okay. All right. Yeah, and I Director Roden. To, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, no. Just to add on to what Craig was saying, you know, these presentations are always tough because we're always a week or two behind. Yeah. Um, so as soon as we put down numbers, uh, it's already wrong and outdated. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Um, Steve, can you go to slide six? So if you look at the left graph and you see the orange number this year compared to the number last year, mm -hmm. you see how the white line, it was actually higher in December. So we were actually getting more snow in December last year than we were in this December. But then you can see, yeah, see right the there, thank you. And then you can see where it keeled over last year and there's just nothing more and we've already exceeded that this year. Yeah. So if, if <clears throat> Mammoth is giving numbers today for snowpack that happened up to yesterday, yeah. that, that's that little orange tail okay. that we're not necessarily capturing in all of our numbers yet, but we will. Okay, awesome, thank you. Maybe the next one will show the, the yeah. math report. It, it, <laughs> I mean, it's certainly going in the right direction, so oh, I'm It's going in a great direction. I'm happy about that. <laughs> right. um, let's see, uh, thank you for the reminder of the um, state water health and safety will have to be paid back. I know I had heard that and it had kind of left my mind. So um, it's just important for us to keep that in the back of our minds. Um, on slide, uh, it's a slide about factors influencing the purchase of water. So it's right after nine, it must be 10. I just don't see a number on it. Um, I think I heard you say that Met is buying surplus water from the north 
to refill here and that they've made a um, revenue allocation to do that. So is, first of all, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, I, th I think you got it right. Okay. So I guess my question is, <laughs> with all this talk about drought, how can there be surplus water in the north that's for sale, but we can't get our allocation from the state water project? Is it just a matter of different sources, or maybe we're looking in places that uh, you know might not be a huge reservoir, but maybe there's certain areas that locally have more water? I'm just trying to get a better picture because it it seems kind of funny when you're we're telling the public that you know, state water project is health and safety only, but oh, there's some folks up there that we're gonna be able to buy some water from. So just, I don't wanna give a, a mixed message, I guess. Yeah. yeah I, I think um, the mixed message is gonna be a major issue this year, without a doubt. So we're, you know, it's, it's gonna be really hard to explain this, especially if MET goes into an allocation after what is looking to be a fairly wet year. Yeah. You know, it's on pace to be record. We don't know what's gonna happen uh, for the next two months. So that's gonna be really difficult because Ryan said it, that Metropolitan has signaled that even if the state water project has less, a 70% allocation or less, MET still could go into their own water supply allocation. That's gonna be really hard to explain to our customers that there may be cutbacks and they're all gonna look out at the news and see flooding all over the place. Yeah. But the reality is, is Met's gonna make that decision based on how much water is in the state water project. So if, if you know, they have to pay back water and they have to start refilling things. So they want to cut down on demands so that they can protect the region for a potential shortage next year. So they're gonna allocate water into refilling storage instead of directly selling it right now. So that's gonna be, it's really hard to message that. Okay. And then to the other part of your question about, well, uh, where are we getting the water? And you know, Met, Met got permission to go uh, try and find deals. They haven't made any deals yet that I'm aware of. So they'll go to potentially other state water contractors and those state water contractors might anticipate what the state allocation is gonna be. And at certain levels, those state contractors have surplus water. So for example, Valley District, they're a state water contractor just like Met. They have a contract for like 102,000 acre feet out of the state water project under a full allocation. Their demands are really below 50,000 acre feet. So they have a potential surplus of 50,000 acre feet under a full uh, state water project allocation. Okay. So they may be one of the people that MET would go and talk to. So Valley would be looking and say, well, if the, if the state project allocates 70%, that's 70,000 acre feet, I only need 20. Hmm. So they might be on the market to sell uh, 20,000 acre feet. But they don't know that yet until they see what the final state water project allocation is, and that usually comes in May. Right. So Met will go out and look for people that are anticipating they're gonna have surplus water and make those deals. Now the other challenge that Met has is they have to look at who the deal is with and where they are in relation to the delta because you have to make sure that you can move the water through the delta. You don't want it to be lost to the gold, you know, out to the ocean. Right. So they only want to buy water that's movable down here. Okay. And in a wet year, that pipe is crowded because they want to operate at full speed. And so they're not operating full speed right now. The pumps are actually in the Delta are only operating at 50% because of a regulatory requirement about turbidity and first flush. So the pumps, you, it's so counterintuitive, they're still not moving as much water as they could be moving right now. So So if they're not moving it, where is it going? Out the Golden Gate. Oh, it so is? So okay. we're actually losing, the number I saw yesterday was about 150,000 uh, CFS is going out the Golden Gate right now. So that's 300,000 acre feet a day. So that's how much water 
is going out into the ocean. Now, of course, the State Water Project can't move 300,000 acre feet a day, but it's indicative of kind of the solve the water crisis point that there needs to be more reservoirs on all the tributaries mm -hmm. to cut down on that amount that's lost to the ocean and save for wet periods, I mean for drier periods. Okay, so when you say the pumps, they're only pumping 50%, that means to other, it like to there, the state water project or to other reservoirs or to, right. okay. Out of the delta, they could oh, pump, okay. they can pump 15,000 CFS. They're only pumping like 7,500 okay. CFS. So they would be putting another 7,000 CFS into the, the Central Valley conveyance that comes down from the delta towards all the ag communities and all of the state contractors, MET being one of the 21 contractors. And they're not doing that because of environmental constraints? Because of environmental constraint, which they call the first flush constraint, flush. which means okay. there's turbidity in the water. Oh. They're worried about the Delta smelt um, hiding in that turbidity and getting drawn into the pumps. Okay. It's a very controversial uh, requirement. Yeah. It seems like most things about water are controversial, <laughs> so. <laughs> but I appreciate your explanation as I get a better picture of all of this, so thank you. I think that was my only, um, yeah, I think th those were my only questions. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Director Isby. When are we looking for the MET allocation? Uh, the MET allocation, they've, they've said it'll be late in the spring, they want to know what DWR is going to do with the state water project. So they're, we're working on the calculation with them right now, but they, they are going to you know, bring it to their committees, and they, I don't think they'll implement something until they have a more firm understanding of what the state water project is going to do. And if the, if the rain continues the way it's going right now for the next, let's say, one month or two months, do you think they're gonna still go ahead and, uh, you know, do the al less allocation so we have to uh, upgrade to the stage, different stages? Uh, my crystal ball would say if it continues to be wet for another month, they, uh, they would probably really raise the state water project allocation and MET would not implement anything. And, and to give you an example, remember 2017 when we all watched Oroville spilling and the, so the state water project had an 85% allocation that year. So it was a really wet year. Wow. And so an 85% allocation by the state water project would be above the 70 that MET has initially kind of set as their teetering point. So we would be in good shape. Other... I might add one more thing. Sure. Director Rizvi asked yesterday about, I get a lot of questions about whether the drought's over, how do I address that? Well, this graphic right here, Steve, if you could go to seven. Th this is why the, all the water managers across the state are saying, hold on, it's wet, but let's not overreact. If you go through the timeline, you say December 30th, it was 34% full. In November, it was probably 29% full. So even though it's been really wet, um, the average of all the mega reservoirs still isn't even back to an average, a long-term average of 68%. So on the 10th, they were only 42% full. So that's still below average. As wet as it's been, we're not back to average storage levels. Now, it's changed, it's changed um, since then. So th these numbers are not uh, up to date. Did we lose? But even Oroville, as of 10 o'clock this morning, is only at 59%. 59%. And that's where I was asking about stage three, the messaging, because already people are so happy that the drought is over. How are we going to yeah. be able so, to? So <coughs> the, we have to continue with the, the message, even though it doesn't look very good <clears throat> to the public. The drought's not over. And we have to wait for that state water project allocation. And I think that's when you'll start this, the DWR will start messaging whether the drought's over or not. But we need to wait for the state to make that decision. Just but as you no. can see, we're still not even up to average reservoir levels, given that this is basically a record year.
just just say no, it's not. Um, so that's what my comment was to the outreach, if, as far as the customers are concerned, because that's the phone calls I keep getting is, you know, we've had all this rain, so the drought's over. And how are we going to simplify it? Because, you know, we can appreciate the graphs, but the general public and population are not taking the time to read this kind of stuff. So what are we doing to message out a very simple, basic message um, or do some kind of a little video that we hold a bucket out there and we only, it's a drop in the bucket or something along those lines that, that resonates with the public, right? Because we as w water people understand all the data that goes into this, but the general population does not. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a very important point that you make, that we have to have these different avenues of messaging, right? You have to have that regional, that general service area, and then that direct messaging. So our strategic communications team is working really hard on the regional and general service area side to make sure that we have those bite-sized messages for our customers that we are putting out on social media through our Insta stories or through Facebook or through fun little TikTok videos that the drought is not oh, over. We do have a what? TikTok. <laughs> mm -hmm. We share they it on do. Insta. <laughs> yes. They do. <laughs> But we do, we have little video snippets that we do put out, um, whether they're GIFs or static messages. We do push those out just as a reminder, like even with these rains that were happening, we put out some messages on Facebook, Insta, um, even on LinkedIn, some people will see them there too, reminding people that even though we have this downpour of rain, it still is not refilling the bucket, like we're still not there. Um, so the messaging is out there, we just have to keep it going, it really is that that fine balance between keeping customers and people aware of what is happening with the drought, that we're not out of the drought yet, and, and that call to action. And so that's where that messaging is kind of being, I don't wanna say split, but it's the call to action is being directed where it needs to be, which is our out of budget customers, and then the situational awareness is being directed to the general public. But no, and, and thank you for that, because it is it is a challenge for us to, we have all these wet days, and then everybody thinks, oh, geez, it's all done, we're good, we've got all this rain. So totally. it is it is a challenge in, in messaging, so thank you for everything that you guys are trying to do to connect the dots. Absolutely. Or connect the drops. Connect the drops. <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh my thank gosh, you. so clever. Mr. President, may I make one more comment? Yes, please. Okay. Um, first of all, D uh, Director Denstead, you have shared with me an analogy that I would love for you to share with the group because I think it, it presents a really good picture as to why we're not out of the drought, and that's the one with the weight gain. But okay. just before that, okay. I just wanted to make uh, one notation. On slide seven, um, it was mentioned that the source for that was Fox News, which I know sometimes can be uh, a hot button, you know, name for some. I but like I noticed local. it's a local Fox yeah, station. This, this not is that, from this. This is the Bay Area. Yeah. No, Fox. So not that they're not the they're same right. company, because I, I don't know if they are or not. But uh, I just want to make that clarification, just in case. But please, would you share that? I've shared that with a lot of people now. Okay, and that's, that's great, oh, that's great. So it, it, it's just the way to put it in context for people to really understand it without getting into a complicated message. So if you are a person who has been a, crouch, a couch cruiser or a couch potato for five years, and all of a sudden you want and decide that you're gonna get into shape because you want to run that marathon of the lifetime and you work out for a week, it doesn't make you ready for that marathon. There is a lot more training that needs to go into that and that's the same thing with the drought. Just because we have a week's worth of rain or a couple of weeks worth of rain, it still does not put us in a position to have achieved our goal of replenishing our reservoirs at 100%, which is ultimately what we'd really love to see because I'm sure all of our water managers would love to see that as um, a turn of the drought. So, but thank you for that, I'm, I'm, uh, thank you for asking. Okay, other comments? I, I want to thank <clears throat> um, the staff for the, the really good presentation, um, and we've had a good discussion. To, to me, 
One of the most telling things and, and things that I, I tell people is on slide seven, um, where it talks about how full the reservoirs are and shows the average is 68%. Even with all the rain that we have had up through the 10th, um, we are more than 25% below an average year. We have a lot of catching up to do. And even if we get enough rain to, and, and snow, to serve demand, we still have to replenish everything that's been taken out of storage. And <clears throat> we're only seeing numbers on above ground storage. We aren't seeing numbers on how far groundwater basins have been drawn down and how much needs to be put back in them to get us back to where we need to be. And that's, that's a really significant number. Um, so those are things that can help with the, the explanation to non-water folks um, of, of why, despite the fact that we're all wet, um, there's not enough water, not yet. And <clears throat> some of the other graphs um, where we're showing, you know, the average year and, and the, you know, the line is very steep and, and ahead of the average year, that looks so much like last year and look how last year ended. So don't, don't put a great deal of faith great point. in that. So, okay, thank you very much. Um, that brings us then to director's reports and requests. Um, SAMPA is first on the list. SAMPA met um, yesterday and took some interesting actions. Um, they rotated their officers as usual. Um, the new chair is Bruce Whitaker from um, Orange County Water District. Uh, I am the vice chair and Milford Harrison from Valley District is secretary treasurer. Um, we appointed, um, rotated some officers on the One Water, One Watershed Steering Committee. Um, Commissioner Denstedt is going to continue as uh, Western's representative on that. I would normally do it, but it conflicts with Chino Basin Water Master board meeting. Um, so Brenda has been covering that and will continue. Milford Harrison will be the alternate. Um, they call the, the person who leads that meeting the convener, um, but basically Director Denset will chair the, that meeting. And um, Let's see, oh, the uh, Lake Elsinore San Jacinto Watershed Authority, um, they will continue with Director Denstedt as the primary representative because that entire area falls within the division she represents. Um, I will be the alternate because I am Western's SAMPA representative. Um, they took no action. They have an old action that compensation for board member attendance at SAMPA meetings increases by 5% per year unless they take an action to not do that. They took no action. So SAMPA's um, board member compensation goes from $240 per meeting to $250 per meeting, which is a 5% increase. So Western, if, they, if I got compensated for a SAMPA meeting, um, we got back $250, $240, so we ate 67 cents. Now we're gonna make a little bit. Does that go to you? No. Oh. I, I don't believe so. It does not, Director. It comes back to Western. That's awesome. So it, yeah. So Western's gonna make, what, a dollar 33. Look at us, for profit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yay. Or yeah, not a dollar three yet. So anyway, um, and they adopted a resolution um, recognizing James Herberg for his contribution um, as the general manager of the Orange County Sanitation District. He either has retired or is about to retire, um, but a long-term guy in the, the water world and was very beneficial to them. And that was it for SAMPA. Uh, MWD. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Yes, it's been very interesting. We did uh, have installed a new chair, so Don Ortega is now the chair of Metropolitan, and committee assignments have been done, so the chair has taken it upon himself to reorganize the group and change some of the committee assignments and what falls under them. Um, I think that the structure is still being worked on because there's been a little bit of pushback while all of the committees have been um, consecutive in their presentation with staff and everything else, the chair was making kind of a proposal to run them concurrent. And so there's been a little bit of pushback from the public. I certainly expressed my concerns that if two committees are running at the same time, I can't be at both places at once. And it's very difficult for me since I'm still on the learning curve. I really wanted to be able to participate in all of those committees and listen, to whether I'm on the committee or not, to be able to listen to the actions that the committee has taken in the discussion um, just to keep going on my learning curve. So with that, I was assigned to three different committees that have been reorganized through the group. I've been placed on the Finance Audit Asset Management Committee, Engineering Operations and Technology Committee, and the Legislation Regulatory Affairs and Communications Committee. So I'll look forward to taking those positions and working with that subject matter that'll be coming before us as we get placed into those and those committees start to meet for the first time. Um, we also had a number of things that was taken as an action at a special board meeting that was done on a, what would usually be a committee assigned day and they did a special board meeting in order to make all those committee assignments with the new chair. As far as the regular board meeting was concerned, a number of items were on the consent calendar to approve what was already in the budget for contract awards and assignments and those continue to move forward. And one thing of interest certainly is for, to secure the board voted for securing water transfers um, for a total of up to 100 million for securing water storage and transfers and deliveries so that general manager has been authorized to go and find the water um, and make those deals and try to figure out and come back to us with some kind of a plan and how that's gonna work out. Uh, we also were able to approve an employment contract, so we have a new general auditor that will be starting at Metropolitan. I was part of the selection committee and the subcommittee off of audit and finance to be able to interview this individual and make recommendations to the board, and I am pleased to announce that Mr. Scott Suzuki was selected to start that position. Um, at Metropolitan as the new auditor controller and he's coming from the County of Orange. So he will be starting in that position and we look forward to working with him. He should be an asset to the team. And as a matter of the changing of the guard for Metropolitan, several members have changed out with their local agencies to start their appointment at Metropolitan. One of the most significant changes, um, if you have not been made aware of this, is that Randy Record, after 20 years of serving on this board, has decided to take a step back and concentrate on some business efforts within the ag community, and he's working on some research projects in order to increase water efficiency with agriculture, and he's decided to make that his primary focus. Um, he will continue to maintain his position on Eastern's board, but he has now been changed out and we are welcoming uh, Jeff Armstrong, who we are very familiar with. Jeff Armstrong has been recently seated on Eastern's board a couple of years ago after retiring for a very lengthy career um, entirely with Rancho California Water District and he retired as their general manager and comes from a very strong finance background since he was the finance director um, and CFO for Rancho prior to being appointed to the general manager position. So I really look forward to working with Jeff. I've known him for a lot of years and really hope to be able to pick his brain on some of the finance stuff that we have because there's a huge deficit in the budget as far as I'm concerned. Um, I did take the position to vote against some pay increases for the general manager and for the ethics officer um, that uh, I didn't 
see how there was equity um, when the bargaining units for the employee groups got 3% and the general manager was giving a 16% increase and a 13% increase to the ethics officer. I didn't see the equity in that, nor do I see the benefit to our customers <clears throat> if we start raising um, some large salaries and some management that's been brought forward on that scale. Um, it concerns me what the trend is and how we are meeting the PERS gap over there and the challenges that we're going to face looking forward on the budget because they are not fully funded on that side. And so my concern is really how are we balancing our finances at Metropolitan since there's already a funding gap and some um, challenges there to make up our budget. So um, I will continue to look at solutions there and hopefully get some um, interesting conversation with my colleague that will sit next to me, um, Mr. Armstrong, to see what his take is on that. Did it pass? Uh, the, did what pass? The comp the, where you just mentioned the compensation package. Just for the general manager and for the ethics officer, yes it did. Oh, okay, I think that's the important part. So, the, um, the other introduction for a new director was uh, Jacqueline McMillan, who is changing out Steve Blois from Cayegas. And so Mr. Blois is stepping back, and she is coming forward. Um, and she seems to be quite capable and has some history as a Metropolitan employee. So I had a very lovely conversation introducing myself with her. And uh, as the changes come forward, as everybody is doing their rotations and assignments are changing, and elections have kind of changed. Um, I'm sure next month we'll bring forward some more changes. Uh, next month we also have a scheduled retreat slash workshop slash study session slash whatever, I, I mean they've called it so many different things at this point, but we will be having our board meetings and those committee meetings and those discussions down at Temecula. So they're bringing that forward and we're having a retreat so um, all of the board can get together, so I look forward to joining my colleagues and not having a two and a half hour drive home in traffic, because <laughs> it's only 20 minutes. Hello. So that will be a very nice change, um, and I will try to see if I can advocate for more meetings in Temecula <laughs> for the board of Metropolitan. But anyway, so those are some of the highlights of everything that's been going on. There's going to be a lot of discussion um, moving forward and I look forward to the workshop slash um, envisioning sessions slash study sessions slash whatever we're calling that down at Temecula for next month. It ought to be um, very enlightening in what we're going to do and hopefully we'll have some more numbers on state allocations, where we're going with water purchases, storage, um, all of the things that we look forward to and then of course coming up in the spring we always start to have those worries and rate discussions of where MET is going to move on the rate increases and how we're not going to because uh, I've not seen the savings to meet the funding gap that we did when MET staff was recommending an 8 to 10 percent increase on the rates we dropped it down to what six and a half and so how do we I have not seen where their budget savings is on that in order to make it possible and how we're not going to bounce back up to that in the coming years. So um, I will continue to ask those questions. And that should take care of it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, Chino Basin Watermaster meets next week. Um, CDA. Chino DeSalter. I, I did not. I did not attend that meeting. Okay. I don't know if Derek um, we, has an update. Yeah, we do have um, some information from them. It was a pretty routine meeting. Nothing, nothing dramatic. Um, RICRA. We will meet next month. Okay. Uh, WRCOG. Uh, WRCOG was dark this month. Thank you. Okay, great. Sarah. Um, so we had a very short meeting, in-person meeting. It was my first in-person meeting for Sora, <clears throat> and uh, it was nice visiting there. Uh, just very routine items that one uh, important uh, item was we ad adopted a resolution honoring the life and service of Elsinore Valley Water District Director Phil Williams. 
And um, since I had not met him, but there were uh, people who talked about how important he was. He was a pioneer in bringing a water solutions to Lake Elsinore. That was very important. So uh, that's about it. Other than that, there was um, financial statements and uh, update on capital uh, projects. Uh, they had some roofing issues that due to, due to the rain, and they're trying to fix that. Other than that, that was a very short 20 minute meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very efficiently run. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So that's about it. Great. Aqua. So Region 9, um, I believe information has been pushed out at this point on Salt and Sea Tour? That no? Not, no. Oh, it's um, only come to me. It's only gone to the board so far. The okay. Region 9 board, and then after tomorrow. It's it pushed out. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure on the timing of that. Uh, there's going to be a Salt and Sea Tour that's going to be offered up for Region 9 members. So um, certainly encourage you if you have availability on your schedule. I believe the date is March 27th? Uh, 25th through the 27th. So, yes. Yeah, so it's going to... Um, it's going to be a full tour and a day, and it's going to be a long day. So we'll be doing a, um, a meet and greet and a reception the night before, is my understanding. And then we'll be doing the full day tour and having a variety of different presentations, a tour bus to go all the way around the Salton Sea and take a look at some of the projects that they're doing out in the Coachella Valley of interest. So uh, Patrick O'Dowd is leading the charge on that from the Coachella Valley and the Salton Sea Authority. And so we're going to be offering that tour up. It's going to be limited because there is only so much space on the bus in order to be able to do that. So I would encourage uh, my colleagues, if you are interested in that, to make it be known sooner rather than later because uh, because uh, the bus is only so big so right my understanding is there are 30 spots okay okay I, I would recommend anybody who's not been to the Salton Sea it's um it. try yeah, to take that tour it really is a very interesting place some of the interest is not real positive but it's an interesting history there's a lot going on down there and that's when the that's when the lake is full so that's, so I'm just kidding <laughs> so, so we will be um, sending that information out, and we're still putting together some of the details. So, um, as uh, next meeting comes around, we should have had all that finalized on <coughs> times, locations, all that stuff, and a, an itinerary to be pushed out. So, and that's all I have, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, director's comments. Start with Director Torres and work the other direction. Yeah, just a few comments. Um, I wanted to first um, start with um, giving out my condolences to the families of the two deputies we lo we've lost in the last month and month and a half. Um, Cordero and Calhoun, um, I've asked President um, Gardner if we could adjourn the meeting in, in their honor um, and, and, you know, uh, reflect on the, their service to our county. Um, La this this weekend, I hope everyone had a good Martin Luther King um, day. I participated in the um, MLK walk uh, by, by the African American um, his historic historical society. society. Historical society. Thank you. It was, it was wonderful. It was a, it was you know, after a few years of of it being on pause. It was wonderful to see everybody who participated. Um, and uh, I hope everyone took time during that day to, to reflect on uh, some of the changes that we need. Um, I also, I'll be this week attending a welcome reception for Adan Ortega um, at Inland Empire Utilities um, Agency. Um, and I do want to say that I am heartbroken. I couldn't attend the dedication um, for uh, directors. Um, Krager and um, Galliano, but it looked wonderful, and I'm I'm happy that that um, those who did attend were there and see the the beautiful photos of their families, be, um, seeing them being honored. And then lastly, uh, this weekend there is um, there is a retreat and open invitation to a um, open house for IE Works, which is a workforce development agency. I encourage my board members, I hope they received an invitation, but I encourage you to go learn more um, uh, the difference that IE Works has made thus far in its two years um, in workforce development, specifically in water and wastewater. 
Um, and so those are my comments. Great, thank you. Director Denstead. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, um, I attended the dedication and it was certainly my honor to speak on behalf of uh, the representatives from this organization. Uh, I never had an opportunity to meet Lois Krieger, but certainly she was a pioneer and she was a woman that really was a force and I've talked to a number of her family members and heard that. And it was certainly my honor to make comments regarding uh, Director Galliano, who I was very close with personally. And um, it was wonderful to see the turnout that we had and all the people that were there. And you know, with all the rain that we've gotten, uh, it was a blessed day. We had beautiful sunshine and the weather was really nice and it made for a very picturesque backdrop for that event. So thank you to staff for all of your efforts to bring that forward and to honor our, our former directors on this board in, in uh, such a beautiful way. I did attend the funeral of Phil Williams. I know there were a couple of staff members that also attend that with me on uh, Sunday the 8th, and he had a tremendous turnout. Um, he was very highly regarded in the water world, in the community, and all of the work that he did in order to facilitate things on LAFCO, on so many different organizations and so many different levels. And we were able to hear about, um, you know, they had it at his high school gym, and he went to Elsinore High, and to hear about all of the work and all of the dedication and all of the service that he provided to high school, to the high school level and to the students and families and all of the things that you, you know, you find out really about somebody's life after they've passed and all the stories that are brought forward and, and what they've done for service just in general. And it was really evident to me after knowing Phil for 20 years, um, he truly had a servant's heart and was really held in the highest regard on so many different levels with so many different groups and communities and Elsinore really, really did turn out for him. So I was, it was very um, long service. It went for three and a half hours because of all the people that got up to speak in regard to him. So it was certainly an honor to um, say a final farewell to my colleague and friend. Um, I also had attended, and I appreciate Director Torres bringing it to the deputies who passed. Being a former law enforcement officer myself, this hits home. And uh, I actually frequent Calhoun's Barbecue, and I am friends with the family. Um, they actually provided the barbecue the night of the viewing of my daughter's mm -hmm. memorial service. and. Uh, provided that to my family. I was familiar with all of them. And he frequented as a helper on days off to support that family and that small business in Marietta. And uh, it is certainly a tragic, tragic loss to the community for such a wonderful individual in the community who just wanted to help people. and. Uh, I attended the candlelight vigil for him last night in Lake Elsinore, and hundreds, hundreds of people turned out. And it was really um, such a nice event to be able to see the community turn out for something that was very tragic. So, um, so I thank you for that, and I will go ahead and end the, my comments today. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. Director Roten. Yes, just, just a couple things. Um, I am still continuing to enjoy the Master Gardener Western um, gardening presentations that happen most months. I think, is it the first Saturday? Second Saturday. Second Saturday. Um, this, I, I didn't bring my notes, so don't ask me what this word means, but it was about permaculture. So, and it was interesting, and I, I wrote down a lot of things, but since I don't have it in front of me, it's way back somewhere here. Um, and just the other uh, thing I wanted to share is this morning, uh, Michael Hadley and I had the privilege of presenting to the Norco Chamber, which um, it was the first time I had gotten to attend one of their breakfast meetings, so I was excited about that, but then also 
being able to, um, of course, talk about solve the water crisis. I just did a very short intro, and Michael carried carried the the uh, presentation, and he did it very well. And as I've seen, any time this is presented, there is huge interest in the room. There were questions being asked back and forth, and even the um, president or. I guess she's the CEO of the chamber. She had a few questions herself. Um, she did bring up an interesting, and she was very clear to say it was a rumor, um, which I, I'll share with you in a minute. But um, I just, I'm seeing in action that the more that we can get this message out there, people are receptive to it, even with all the rain that we've had. They're, they're cautious, they're wondering, they're asking about it. So um, it was really a, um, just a, a pleasure to be there. So the rumor, and she highly clarified that this was a rumor. She had heard that someone had said that the water industry is thinking about doing turnoffs, kind of like the elect company does when the supply gets short. And we were like, mm -mm. no, <laughs> no, no, mm -hmm. that is not happening. You can't turn off the water. <laughs> so I was glad she brought it up because I figured if she had heard that somewhere, other people have right. heard that Probably. somewhere. Yeah. So, so good for her to ask the question. And someone even came up to us afterwards and said something about the interest in the room, that they were impressed by, um, by the interest. So thank you, Michael, for, I know it was very early. Um, and you were very well prepared, and I really just appreciate you being there. So that's it. Great. Thank you. Hey. Director Rizvi. Just a few comments. I did attend the dedication for the um, Director Galliano and Luis Krieger's uh, um, in uh, um, Almost, it used to be my district. I keep on saying no. that's my, uh, but no longer it's in my district. I think it's going to be Grace, Director Torres' district. Lake Matthews. Lake Matthews. So, but it is your district, right? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was a beautiful ceremony. And um, hearing from, um, I had heard from Director Galliano's family, but hearing from Luis Krieger's grandson was mm -hmm. really, something that uh, you know touched my heart, something what she's done, and maybe we are all carrying her legacy of being in this industry and uh, making change happen. So that was wonderful. And also I was uh, able to attend Deputy Cordero's uh, memorial services, and uh, there were so many people and um, you know, the mess uh, uh, his family and all of that. It was, it was just beautiful, and it's just sad to see what has happened. So I think uh, Gracie and Mike, to um, you know, close this uh, meeting in their, um, in their memories. So, and that's about it. Okay, thank you. Um, I also attended the Lake Matthews dedications and wanted to compliment Director Denstead on her presentation. She really did a very good job. Um, I knew... Lois Krieger, slightly, a, a truly amazing person. She was one of Western's first directors. Um, she was the first female director of, uh, no, not director, chair of Metropolitan Water District, served many years there. Um, I believe she was um, the chair of Aqua for a while, chair of a national water organization. Um, she was truly a groundbreaker um, and a, a really interesting family. Uh, some, some of the relatives are still very much in the water business. Um, in fact, Krieger & Stewart is a company that does business with Western, and they are related that to that the, family. I always thought of that thing, yeah. but I never. Um, n nephews or, or something. It's, it's not direct lineal descendants, but same family. Um, let's see, oh, I gave a presentation um, to the Downtown Area Neighborhood Association um, with the able assistance of Michelle Adams um, on the 
drought and the future of, of water um, and kind of closed that with solved water crisis. It was really well received and last evening I got a phone call from the Historic Wood Streets Association who said, can you come talk to us on okay. <laughs> February 4th? So I will be doing that one as well. There were over 30 people at the, the Dana meeting, um, which is pretty decent turnout for those. Um, so that one's coming up, and I also will be attending uh, a Don Ortega's reception tomorrow evening. Um, so I will see you there. I'll see you there. <laughs> um, and that's it for me. Uh, request for future agenda items, Director Rizvi? Good. Director Roten? No. Director Denstad, Director Torres? I, I would ask if we could just get a quick update either to the board or to the ComGov committee on status and schedule for rollout of the uh, new logo and communication of all of that. Okay. Um, information items, we have some things, our usual set of reports in the um, backup package. Does anyone have any questions on those for staff before we move away from that? Okay. Um, we do have two closed sessions. Um, I will announce now that um, following closed session, I will adjourn our meeting in memory and honor of deputies Isaiah Cordero and Darnell Calhoun and thank them for their service and their sacrifice. Mr. General Consul. Uh, yes, we will be going into closed session to discuss the two items that are listed on the uh, agenda. Yeah, um, we will take a, a short break, five minute break before we actually convene in closed session. Um, and then following closed session, we'll come back to make any announcements that are appropriate from closed session and formally adjourn the meeting. Let's, yeah, um, we're, we are, let, let's do it maybe just as we are about to adjourn. Yeah. Yes. Sure. We
Okay. We are returned from closed session. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please conduct a roll call? Thank you. Director Torres? Here. Director Denstead? Present. Director Roten? Here. Director Rizvi? Here. President Gardner? I am present. Thank you. You have a, a full quorum. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Um, General Consul, is, do we have a reportable action? Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, the board met in closed session and there was no reportable action. Okay. So with that then, um, we will adjourn our meeting um, in memory of uh, Deputies uh, Cordero and Calhoun um, and thank them and their families for their service. Thanks everyone, we are adjourned.